Chapter 16 The number four continued. He who aspires to be a sage and to know the great enigma of nature must be the heir and despoiler of the sphinx, is the human head in order to possess speech, is the eagle's wings in order to scale the heights, is the bull's flanks in order to furrow the depths, is the lion's talons to make a way on the right and the left, before and behind, transcendental magic, Levi, 31. The Pythagoreans called number four the great miracle, a god after another manner, a manifold, the foundation of nature, the key bearer or key keeper of nature, the door of the east, etc. as it was held by them to be the foundation of truth for was the number upon which they took their oaths. This was to them the same as swearing upon the foundation stone of the truth. Many ancient and modern languages have a name for the deity composed of four letters, thus the Assyrian Adad, Egyptian Ammonius, Toit or Tot, Persian Sire or Sire, Turkish Izar, Tartar Idga, Arabian Al, or Allah, Samaritan Jab. Greek Theo, Latin Deus, French Dieu, German Gott, etc. In all these cases the four letters indicate God manifesting in his works, while the addition of another letter to the name, such as changing all to Allah, taught to Thoth, Yezu to Jesus, etc., signifies a personal and human incarnation or embodiment of that God, number five being the number of human manifestation. An ancient legend relates that when God created the four cardinal points, he left the north unfinished, saying, If any be equal, let him finish it. The esoteric truth back of this allegory is that the north, through the pole star, leads into a new and higher octave of world systems, hence cannot be finished until all that manifests on this planet has evolved to the point where it can enter the new system. Eliphaz Levi connects the four symbolic beasts with the four magic elements and elementary spirits as follows. The magical elements are an alchemy, salt, sulfur, mercury, and azoth, and Kabbalah, the macroprosopis, and the two mothers. In hieroglyphics, the man, eagle, lion, and bull, in old physics, according to vulgar names and notions, air, water, earth, and fire. But in magical science, we know that water is not ordinary water, fire not simply fire, etc. These expressions conceal a more recondite meaning. Modern science has decomposed the four elements of the ancients and reduced them to a number of so-called simple bodies, that which is simple, however, is the primitive substance properly so called there is therefore only one material element which always manifests by the tetrad in its forms we shall therefore preserve the wise distinctions of elementary appearances admitted by the ancients and shall recognize air fire earth and water as the four positive and visible elements one of magic in genesis we find four mystical rivers represented as watering the Garden of Eden, Pison, Gien, Hittical, and Euphrates. Taking Eden as a symbolic reference to the body of man, these four rivers correspond to the four great arteries proceeding from the heart which carry the purified blood to the four regions of the body indicated. The first river Pison, whose meaning is joined together as one, which compasseth the whole land of Havila, refers to the innominate artery which is formed by the right subclavian and the right common carotid arteries joined as one. The meaning of the word Havila is to bring forth, to form, create, to supply strength, all of which vividly portrays the offices of the brain and right arm and head which are supplied by this river of blood. The river Gien, signifying to run out, to burst forth into thought, 
refers to the left common carotid artery which supplies the left side of the brain and head. The third river, hitical, meaning freely flowing, refers to the left subclavian artery which supplies the left arm. The fourth river, Euphrates, meaning to increase, the creative power, the fruitful river, etc., symbolizes the descending aorta, the great river of blood that supplies the lungs and the entire body below the diaphragm, including the creative centers. Thus the four rivers watered the whole land of Eden. For among the Greeks there were also four symbolic rivers, but these were represented as being in the netherworld or the plane of physical embodiment, namely the Phlegathon, Cocytus, Styx, and Acheron, whose symbology we have described elsewhere. The number four also appears in the four hours of the day and the watches of the night, in the four cherubim, in the four wheels of Ezekiel, in the four ages of man, infancy, youth, maturity, old age, in the four horses of Neptune, and in divers other places too numerous to mention, but always carrying out the basic meaning of a physical foundation. In many places in the Bible we read that if anything is taken unjustly it must be repaid fourfold. This is not to be taken literally, for it simply symbolizes that the injustice must be squared or that the four lords of karma must each be satisfied or the adjustment made on the four planes, the earth, the psychic, the mental and the spiritual by the synthesizing power of the spirit. This is the key to the workings of the law of karma. The children of Israel are represented as wandering 40 years in the wilderness. A wilderness is not a desert, for it may embrace beautiful mountains, forests, and streams. It is simply a region that has been left to nature and is uncultivated. If we regard the story of the wanderings of Israel as historically true, there are many facts hard to reconcile. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, as regards the mountain of the law in particular, if the record of Exodus 19 is strictly historical, we must seek a locality where 600,000 fighting men, or some 2 million souls in all, could encamp and remain for some time, finding pasture and drink for their cattle, and where there was a mountain, with a wilderness at its foot, rising so sharply that its base could be fenced in, while yet it was easily ascended, and its summit could be seen by a great multitude below. Where, then, was this mountain? It is therefore plain that the whole story is an allegory. The wilderness is the natural or unregenerate world. The children of Israel are those of God's people who are led out of the darkness of ignorance and the slavery of the senses by an inspired prophet or lawgiver, and who are following the great law through the wilderness into the promised land. All the adventures described will be found to express experiences in the unfolding spiritual life. And the forty years are composed of four complete cycles of ten, in this allegory called years, but called days when referring to the four periods of fasting which Jesus is represented as passing in the wilderness. Those who are seeking the promised land and to climb the holy mount must wander during these four cycles until they learn four fundamental lessons concerning the law of divine love. In the first, they must learn that all their unhappy experiences, be they sickness, poverty, or inharmony, are not punishments inflicted by some arbitrary God or being, but are the results of their own disobedience to the law either in the present or past lives. In the second, they must learn that the law of love can so order their physical bodies that in their flesh they shall see God, that all sickness is the ultimate result of rebellion against the law, both personally and through the race thought in the third, 
they must know something of the interpenetration of the various planes of existence how to protect themselves from undesirable influences from the astral plane and also realize their duty to themselves their fellow men the lower kingdoms and elemental forces in fact to all things over which man was given dominion in the fourth period they must pass a cycle of testing and proving during which all they have learned in the three periods is put to the test and proved when this same symbol is used in connection with the forty days of fasting in the wilderness it deals with a different phase here we find the christ man who has dedicated his life to the uplift of humanity driven by the spirit into the wilderness thus are advanced souls driven into the wilderness of the outer life by the spirit through their love of humanity and their desire to help once having incarnated in this wilderness to a certain extent they forget their high mission and find themselves fasting and alone seemingly forsaken they must fast until they learn that even though they have the power to turn the stones into bread still they do not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god for the dense physical stage of human evolution symbolized by the stones cannot nourish the christ man until instead of being a stone it has become the word made flesh thus they pass four cycles of fasting first trying to feed their spiritual hunger with the joys of dire material world but finding that the mere possession of things can never satisfy the soul hunger then they enter upon a new day in which they realize the greatness of mind and perhaps are swept away to the extreme of declaring that mind is all and all is mind they now seek in the intellectual conceptions of the mental realm in subtle philosophies and metaphysical speculations to appease the hunger of their souls but sooner or later their souls find that they are still feeding on the husks and still fasting from that true spiritual food which alone can satisfy then they seek satisfaction in the psychic phenomena which their intellectual search has brought to their attention at first perhaps their hunger is appeased by the phenomena of seances and messages and platitudes from their departed friends and anything that will lift their consciousness above the material and mechanistic concept of life later this proves to be but a mental diversion although it is a training which enables them to appreciate the real spiritual bread of life which must come from the christ within and not from without not even from the disembodied thus they pass the fourth day or cycle in proving that none of these things bring soul satisfaction by this time they are unhungered and only then hold the angels messengers of god not disembodied mortals come and minister unto them many sincere students are to be found in each of these cycles but if they are all earnestly seeking spiritual food they are not to be condemned or even looked down upon by those who have taken a step higher perhaps number one except the soul who has reached the fourth day will pass through all phases of fasting in one life but every soul will pass through either longer or shorter expressions of these periods the day periods are those in which enthusiasm fills the soul and the things it feeds on seem all satisfying for the time being the night periods are those in which the former food no longer satisfies and the soul is truly hungry and unsatisfied there are four natural classes of humanity corresponding to the four main divisions of the grand man in one of which all mankind finds expression these great divisions or castes are not arbitrary classifications but are expressions of the four characteristic forms of human activity 
Among the Hindus the grand man is called Brahma and the four classes are said to have sprung from his body as follows. From his head sprang the natural teachers, philosophers, scientists, and priests, Brahmins. From his arms sprang the natural warriors, soldiers, rulers, and executives, Ashatriyas. From his body sprang the natural husbandmen, purviers, and merchants, Vaishyas and from his feet those whose attainments fit them only for mechanical and manual labor, sudras. While this is a natural classification of human activities and social life, which is as easily discernible in the Western world as in the Eastern, in the East it has been greatly overemphasized, greatly abused and degraded by hard and fast lines of cleavage which in their practical workings do not permit the entering of a higher caste from a lower through demonstrated ability and merit although such opportunities were always open in the earlier ages and still are theoretically in india today it is unphilosophical to talk about the equality of all men if the term is used in the usual sense of uniformity, for there is no such thing as equality or uniformity in the manifested universe. Every single expression of life is an expression of an individuality that is different from every other expression. Only in the realms of the undifferentiated is there uniformity. As soon as differentiation begins, uniformity is destroyed and individuality reigns. It is true that in their divine essence and as equally precious expressions of the one life, also in their divine possibilities, all men are equal and hence should have equal opportunities to express their divine essence and achieve their possibilities but they are not equal in the degree of their expression of their divinity nor in the degree of their attainments the law is unity and diversity but never uniformity there are four chief stages in the civilization of man the most primitive form is the nomadic in this stage man wanders from place to place in search of food and without any settled place of abode his food is only that which nature produces without any effort on his part and which she offers him for the taking i e fruits nuts game etc this is the stage of irresponsibility each day satisfies its own needs hence no thought is taken or provision made for the future the welfare of the self reigns supreme in this rudimentary stage of intellectual and spiritual unfoldment man's highest conception of the divine is as a mighty and ever successful hunter the second stage is the pastoral in this stage man has grasped the idea that he can secure his food more easily by taming animals and raising them in flocks and herds than by having to hunt an individual animal every time he needs food while he is still more or less of a wanderer, changing his abode with the needs of his flocks and herds, yet he is more settled than in the nomadic stage, for his wanderings are only within a limited area. Although little provision is made for the future, except to prepare for and take advantage of the seasons, still responsibility, forethought, and the beginnings of unselfishness are being developed. In this stage man's highest ideal of the divine is as a tender and loving shepherd. As the pastoral wanderings or migrations become more restricted man establishes a corral for his herds, founds a more permanent home and begins to cultivate the soil. Thus he passes into the agricultural stage, founds a permanent home, accumulates possessions not easily kept under tents or transported in caravans, and begins to cultivate the arts. In this stage responsibility must be assumed, forethought taken and preparation made for the next year's crops. Also since provision must be made for his family and domestic animals during the winter season, man is forced to develop more unselfishness by providing for others. 
and this stage his ideal of the divine is that of an husbandman or loving head of the household or father and his idea of heaven is a mansion in the skies a home in a blissful realm of perpetual summer with singing dancing etc overgrowth of population in a fixed position necessitates a division of labor hence there next ensues the industrial period which evolves into the scientific stage man now realizes that no individual can live his life to himself alone or without considering and affecting others he therefore begins to develop cooperative efforts for the best good to all although still giving full scope for the expression of individuality within the unity of the whole as such cooperation requires greater individual responsibility and still greater unselfishness on the part of the individual in this stage unselfishness reaches its highest expression greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends in this stage man's highly developed intellect and spiritual unfoldment shows him that the physical world is but an imperfect materialization of that which is immaterial hence his ideal of the divine is as an all-pervading and life-giving spirit whose urge to manifest the ideal is the cause of all manifestation and all evolution that the manifestation and the ideal may become one or complete its cycle by returning to its source let number four remind you always to be honest and square with your fellow men with yourself and with god determine that you will give others and yourself a square deal that you will face and square up all mistakes faults and failings and thus lay your foundation stone that your future life may be founded on the rock of truth and be stable that even though you find this world but a wilderness and so-called religious teachings but stones and the voice of the tempter ever in your ear nevertheless being firmly established upon your foundation stone of truth you know that you have within you the power of the christ to conquer and make square all conditions 